Um, tonight, we're here um, to start our One Book, One Community um, kickoff with Gil Harrell, our favorite musicologist. Uh, and tonight, he's going to discuss the music of horror, Chills Up Your Spine. Thank you for joining us tonight, Gil. My pleasure. Great opportunity to uh, scare the uh, living daylights out of a lot of people tonight. So. Looking forward to that. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you, Pat. Thank you, uh, Karen and Krishna to the Darien Library. What a pleasure to uh, to be here virtually with everybody. I see uh, many familiar, friendly names over in the chat. Thank you all for spending the next hour with me. Um, this is part of the uh, the One Book One Community Event Program series that uh, that Pat mentioned, and um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end of the program. But uh, for us, we're gonna jump right into it because we've got about a hundred years of history to cover and an awful lot of repertoire. And I have something on the order of about 10 or 12 examples, uh, different paradigmatic examples from different uh, eras and, and epics in, uh, in the history of film, but also uh, different genres and subgenres under the umbrella of horror. So there's an awful lot of the talk about tonight. And I, I wanna preface this by saying that it may perhaps be surprising for me to confess to you that I am actually not the biggest fan of horror films. Um, I have seen them, I've seen a few, uh, you know, I've watched them when I was younger and there have been times when I um, would try to uh, impress perhaps a, a girl on a date when I was a teenager and take them to a horror film, but for the most part, I, uh, I avoid these, uh, this genre in general. And I'll tell you a little bit about why it is. I've been reflecting and ruminating uh, about why that is in, in the last uh, few days, a week or so. And I think it is connected intimately to my sense of hearing, my appreciation of uh, sonic uh, phenomena. And I think it's something that everybody is sensitive to uh, although in my case, I may be hypersensitive to it. And I'll point out exactly what I mean by that as we go through the program. Well, we know, uh, broadly speaking, that uh, as far as the intersection of music and film goes, we trace it to the 1930s, more or less. Um, of course, before that, they did have films, silent films, of course, uh, don't have music, although it wasn't uncommon in the early 20th century for a musician to be present at the, uh, the showing of uh, a silent film and to improvise a score based on what they were seeing play out on the screen. That's a really interesting skill set to develop. And there are some famous composers in the Western canon who in fact uh, were involved in exactly that trade when they were uh, in the early stages of their career. Dmitry Shostakovich is a good example. Shostakovich would sit in Russian theaters in the 1920s and he would improvise um, piano music that would accompany, and it was whatever he felt uh, matched or resonated with what was being depicted on the screen. What we're going to see tonight is really interesting, and that is this. I think it's always good when we have a program that covers such a broad gamut, such a wide spectrum of repertoire. We want to have uh, some fundamental objectives laid out for ourselves so we don't get lost and swept up in this, uh, in this huge uh, spectrum of music we're going to listen to. So let me su suggest that we entertain the following questions before we get started with specific repertoire and with listening to uh, excerpts from the various films we're going to look at. Um, I'm actually going to be sharing screens, um, Barbara, so you'll see um, what I'm seeing momentarily. So let me go ahead and do that right now. OK, well, here we go. Ominously, this is a, a good uh, indication of what we're in for tonight. Well, here are some questions that we should entertain and some objectives that we should set for ourselves. Number one, how does horror, generally speaking, as a, as a, a genre, how should music make horror more horrifying? That is to say, what's the difference between watching a scary movie on mute and what's the difference between watching it with the sound on. Well, obviously music is going to make it scarier, right? If you watch a horror film on mute with the captions on, it's not gonna be nearly as scary. In fact, it might even be comical without the music. And when we say music here and in general tonight, 
we should perhaps put an asterisk, a qualifying asterisk next to it, because some of what you're going to hear is depending on the definition of music that you subscribe to, it may be closer to sound effects or general white noise, triangle waves, delta waves, uh, what they call LFE, low frequency effects. Um, it's not always going to be melodic. It's not always going to have a light motif or a tune that you can hum or sing or whistle after you've watched the scene. It may be more of a percussive effect, something that's going to physically jolt you, but that's not always the case. So again, how does music make what we're seeing on the screen more terrifying? We're going to look at many examples and we're going to see that there is really, uh, it's not that there's no one right answer, it's that there's many uh, correct answers to that question. Music can be used and deployed by the composer a number of different ways, and I'm excited to share those with you. Another question we might entertain tonight is, what is the role of instrumentation? What is the role of tonality? What is the role of timbre? Uh, these are three things that are really paramount in this discussion. Let me explain what they all, each one is, and then we'll um, look at examples. So we talked about uh, tonality, which is to say, do we feel like we're in a key? Do we feel like we have a, a central tone that has primacy, that somehow projects a sense of stability onto us as listeners? Or is this music going to avoid tonality? Is it going to be so dissonant and so unstable that it will be, in fact, impossible for us as listeners to determine a central stable tone? Obviously, for most of the music we listen to, whether it's popular music, and by popular music, I mean basically anything that's in the top 40 and has been for decades. Are we uh, talking about something that adheres to those sets of rules, which goes all the way back to the late Renaissance, where we have keys, and this is in C major, this is in A minor, or are we going to have something else? I think many of you are probably positing uh, a guess right now that um, we're not going to have that stability, and you're correct. We are going to move into a, a realm, for the most part, where the music is going to eschew any sense of tonal stability. Second thing I mentioned uh, was uh, uh, harmony, right, uh, which is connected, and I talked about uh, timbre, um, which talks really refers to sound color. Are we talking about acoustic instruments like violins, violas, celli, basses, uh, trombones, trumpets, flutes, etc., or are we perhaps talking about well synthesized sounds, sounds that come from either analog or digital electronic equipment, which is going to provide us with a sound that can't be um, created by a natural acoustic instrument? I think that's an interesting question. To entertain and what we're going to see is of course there's both but when we get to the 1970s and really by the 1980s um, there's a, a huge surge in horror genre uh, composers uh, approach they're they're really starting to use a tremendous amount of electronic sounds um, so all of this is is going to uh, be something we can consider tonight the role of tonality the role of timbre um, and the role of dissonance versus consonance. Dissonance, of course, refers to in music where you have tones that, well, they, they fundamentally disagree. When sounded simultaneously, they create instability. Now, let me point something out. People get this wrong all the time, and I, I, ooh, I love to correct them. The inner uh, professor in me has to uh, point out that dissonance on its own does not sound bad. People say that all the time. What's dissonance? It means that music sounds bad. But that's not true. Um, dissonance does not sound bad. Uh, Beethoven uses dissonance all the time. Mozart uses dissonance. Bach uses dissonance. Wagner uses dissonance. We wouldn't say that these composers sound bad, although some might make that case for Wagner if you're not a, a Wagner -like. Um But what is it about this dissonance phenomenon that we're going to see tonight that really makes the music um, pop? And we're going to see that especially when we get to 1960 and we we look at the score of Psycho, which we will do early in the program. I see we already have some questions coming in. Thank you so much for the questions. Uh, I encourage you to use the, uh, the chat function or the Q&A function as well. Okay. Great. So use the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, which you can see on your bottom panel. And uh, I will take moments of uh, reflection uh, throughout the program and we'll address those. Okay. 
I'm going to look first at one of the early films, and I have chosen this because uh, it's going to be the subject of a program next week when um, Darien Library is going to be hosting another event in this One Book, One community series. And uh, it's, it's going to address the Frankenstein and Boris Karloff, who of course played the monster in the film, which is uh, from the 1930s. So let's take a look at the monster meeting his bride. Now, what I want you to listen for in this particular uh, clip, we won't listen to more than 30 seconds, is um, just how lush and romantic it is. It's mostly um, in terms of timbre, we're going to hear string instruments, the violins, violas, cellos, and basses that dominate the romantic orchestra. We're going to hear uh, some brass instruments. But in general, this score is going to uh, resemble a score from the 19th century. It's not going to sound uh, bitingly dissonant. Uh, it is going to have some dissonance, but it is primarily going to be based in the symphonic tradition. Now, the composer here uh, for the score was uh, someone named Franz Waxman, or Franz Waxman, but Waxman, who was German-born. And um, as we'll see uh, in our next uh, excerpt, when we look at Psycho, um, this is one of many, many Hollywood film scores, which was scored by uh, German or I said Jewish composers of German origin. So Franz Waxman wrote the score here and listen to how lush and romantic this is. Even though it's in the 1930s, Waxman is very much writing in the style of Brahms and beyond. So Brahms, Mahler, Dvorak, composers in that style. Let's have a listen. I guess she um, is not too enchanted with uh, Boris Karloff as the monster there. But again, just a brief 30 second clip. And what do we hear? We hear primarily string instruments. We do hear some dissonant chords, but they're not bitingly dissonant, as we'll see in the next clip um, with the famous shower scene from Hitchcock's uh, Psycho, which for many is the, uh, the standard bearer, the flagship horror movie of the 20th century. Um, with its, its story about the Norman Bates. If you don't know the story, I'm, I should say before I go on, there are gonna be spoilers tonight and there may be some disturbing imagery. So if you have very young children watching, uh, I encourage them to watch. I think this is an important part of uh, music history and, and American film history, but there may be some clips here which are somewhat disturbing. I have endeavored to choose clips which don't have anything too macabre, too uh, grisly depicted. And if it helps to, um, to diffuse some of the tension before we watch this next scene, you should know that what looks like blood in this scene is actually chocolate syrup. So the producers of the film use chocolate syrup, uh, which translates very well in a black and white format to blood uh, because of the viscosity of chocolate syrup, apparently is very uh, close to the viscosity of human blood. So uh, for all you um, forensic scientists there, uh, and aspiring forensic scientists, now you know. All right, so in this scene, um, well, we have uh, someone who's gone to the Bates Motel, and she's been invited to dine with Norman Bates, the proprietor of said Bates Motel. Now, what we're gonna find out in the film is that Norman Bates is psychotic. He is, uh, he, he has really alter egos, and, and his alter ego is, is his mother who he's killed, by the way, prior to the events in the film. And um, he puts on a wig and goes around and commits murders while dressed as his mother, again, who he has murdered prior to the events in the film. So we don't know that at this point, it will be revealed later on. Uh, here, the lighting and the camera angle is presented in such a way that we, um, we have a strong, harsh backlighting uh, behind the murderer. So we actually don't see the murderer's face, but we do see what looks like a woman with a wig on, um, although it is somewhat uh, nebulous, I suppose. And, um, and of course, we as the audience, we see through a semi-translucent shower screen as the murderer is approaching. Now, what we're gonna listen for here, once again, is string instruments. So we're still using acoustic instruments primarily uh, in the 1950s, this is 1960s. So uh, presumably Bernard Hermann, the composer, writing this in the 1950s. Uh, apparently, the story goes that when Hitchcock hired Hermann, he only wanted to pay him a certain amount, which was apparently a pretty low salary. This was not based on uh, Hitchcock's opinion of the composer, but simply because Hitchcock didn't think that music was gonna be particularly important to the film. And then when he heard the uh, string music here for the shower scene, what uh, 
Bernard Herrmann called the murder music. Um, apparently, Hitchcock doubled Herrmann's salary on the spot. So, an interesting anecdote which um, illuminates this point that we've been getting at so far in the program, which is that if you want to make something scarier, add some music to it. Here we go. We're listening for extremely high pitched violins. In fact, they're so high that if you would write these notes, you would have to go up ledger line after ledger line after ledger line on the treble clef. It's so high that even without any other note, I think most people would describe it as piercing and extremely uncomfortable to listen to. Now, Bernard Herrmann, the composer, is going to dial up that discomfort level by adding incredibly dissonant intervals next to those uh, very, very high-pitched string notes. And I'll show you a score momentarily. First, let's refresh ourselves. Many of us have seen it. Here is the murder scene from Psycho. It is perhaps no wonder that this scene has obtained such iconic status in the horror genre. The music is a big part of that. Let's take a look at the score. Okay, here are those, um, those high notes I mentioned. Now, here's the treble clef. This is the clef we use for very high notes. Uh, violins read this, flutes read this, piccolos read the treble clef. So it's, it's the highest uh, clef that we have, really, in uh, modern notation. And just look how many ledger lines you have to go up to get to this E flat in the seventh octave. Uh, well, really, if you think about a piano, this note is almost off the piano. So it's, it's that high. It's really at the edge of uh, what really can be played by a violin. Um, and then when the second uh, note comes in, this on its own, played uh, just on its own, is, is already disturbing. But when it's joined by a second tone, it's the E natural below the E flat, which creates this interval of major seventh, or really it's not a major seventh, it's, it's a diminished octave. My music theory students um, would, should, should be able to point that out. And then we get another cluster tone right above it and more cluster tones, the E natural down here in the fifth octave against the E flat in the seventh octave. Basically, uh, what I'm getting at is that when you have tones that are almost the same, but not quite, you get the, sh um, the harshest kind of dissonance. So here we have E flat and E natural. Again, they're both versions of E. They're so close that when they're struck simultaneously, um, they create this this whir, whir, whir pattern, what you call beats, nothing to do with rhythmic beats. Uh, it's physics, really. And that's what we're hearing, the frequencies that are almost, almost lined up, but they're not. And so we get this very uncomfortable sensation as listeners. The other thing about this, obviously, is that when you um, have these very, very uh, sharply articulated notes, it's going to evoke the stabbing motion, right, that Norman Bates is using in the guise of the murderer, the, the mother, his alter ego. Let's listen a little bit. You see it says gliss here. That comes from the Italian word glissando. And what it means is don't play the note exactly on the beat. Sort of scoop up to it, slide up. And when we have a slide in that register so high, uh, it's just going to make it even more disturbing to the listeners. So if you're wondering why does the psycho shower scene work so effectively, uh, to heightening the terror factor really has to do with tessitura or register. It has to do with how high the notes are, how they're articulated in that stabbing, striking motion, and most of all, with these crushing uh, dissonances that pop up between notes like E flat and E natural. So it's, it's really, um, it'll put it this way, you wouldn't want to, you know, play it for a young child perhaps, but it works here in the uh, film. All right, moving ahead. Jaws, right? What, what more um, iconic example of, uh, of music that intensifies building up to the moment of, of horror do we have than uh, the, these iconic scenes in Jaws where this shark is on the loose? Let's listen. Okay, so we pause. Already notice what John Williams here, the composer, that same John Williams who wrote this, scored a sound to a Star Wars, and to Jurassic Park and E.T. and seemingly every other movie I grew up with. Um, he wrote the score here and notice what he does. He starts, instead of very high as we have with Hitchcock, as we have with Bernard Herrmann's score, what does John Williams do? He starts in the very lowest register because where do sharks live? They're underneath you. They strike from below. 
So it's a, it's a stroke of brilliance here. And of course, sharks don't teleport, they approach you. And they're hunters with very keen senses. So how do they approach you? Perhaps very slowly, like a hunter, they circle you, they, they put you in the proverbial crosshairs, and then this burst, this frenetic burst of energy as they go in for the kill, right? Notice how the music mirrors all that. It's quite brilliant, actually. We start out with these low cello and bass notes, bass notes, really, in the zero octave and then the first octave. Bernard Hermann has violins in the seventh octave. Here, we're in the very basement of the piano, if you will. Okay. So it, by the time it builds up, after just about a minute, we actually have this grand symphonic sound, which is more um, in line with what you'd hear in Star Wars or Indiana Jones or one of William, William's other scores. But when it starts, it's all, this one is all about the slow burn, the crescendo, and the steady rise from the low register, from the pianissimo dynamic, quiet and foreboding and ominous with these punctuated pauses where we have uh, pause, silence. Sometimes silence can be just as effective as notes themselves. Beethoven, I think, uh, shows that over and over again, especially in the slow movements of his piano sonatas and his symphonies, we often get these moments of repose where we arrive at a fermata and he just lets the silence breathe. And here, John Williams does the same thing. The camera work is very much in parallel with the music. As the notes get higher, so too the camera ascends. The camera, of course, representing the perspective of good old Jaws, the shark. And then at the moment that the bite happens, um, the music reaches these sort of percussive punctuations. So it's, it's very cleverly designed. Um, if we look at the score, this is an arrangement for piano. You get a sense of how this works. You can see here the eight means this is an octave lower than E2. So this is E in the first octave. It's really, you see these symbols here? They're the, look how different this looks than this. Remember, these were treble clefs with ledger lines above. Here we have the bass clef with ledger lines below and even an 8 dB sign. All right, let's listen. Now, everybody knows this motif in the bass, right? Bottom, bottom, bottom. Two notes, and guess what the distance is? Do you remember what we said about the shower scene in Psycho? What Bernard Herrmann does? He puts the closest intervals you can. Remember, he used E flat and E, which you don't have to know what that means, but just we said the two close notes, which creates that sense of instability, that very crunchy dissonance. Well, John Williams does the same thing here. It's E and F here. Again, the semitone, the half step. Dee -dum, dee -dum. Can't get closer than that, at least not on a, on a piano, uh, and not in the 12-tone the system of Western music. You can do it in quarter-tone music, but you can't do it, um, and, and you can't get any closer than this in standard uh, pitch uh, theory. So, so once again, we see um, how register factors in here. Low notes here, representing the uh, abyssal plane where the, uh, the shark dwells down in the depths of the ocean. We have the intensification of the rhythm and the tempo as it gets faster and higher as the shark ascends towards the surface to make that fatal strike. So it's very cleverly done here by John Williams. All right, I wanna move on. I see we're about halfway through the program already. Uh, before we move on, I have to show you this because many people say, well, you know, do these composers get these ideas out of nowhere? And of course, they're all influenced by whatever it is that they grew up around and they studied in college and conservatory if they did go to a study in an institution of higher learning. But um, one of the funniest comments uh, I get, and I get this comment uh, regularly from my students, when I teach uh, the music of uh, Antonin Dvorak, the great Czech composer, late romantic composer, is when we look at the New World Symphony, his Symphony Number no. 9, from the late 19th century. Um, if you look at the last movements of the Dvorak Symphony, have a look at this. Do you see the, everyone's in unison? B, C, well, they're up a fifth. So they're going, same intervals, semitone, da 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 -da, da -da, da -da. So actually, this is written in the 1890s, and uh, let's have a listen to it. So just in those opening bars, uh, the, the uh, 
similarity, the parallels with John Williams, uh, really uncanny, right? To have this longer tone followed by a shorter tone, then a rest, then to repeat it, and then to intensify the, te the rhythm and the tempo. Um, um, it's hard to say. I, I haven't read anything that John Williams said specifically, oh yeah, Jaws was influenced by Dvorak, but it's uh, hard to deny the parallels there. Okay, moving on to the 19, um, this is 1975 is Jaws. Uh, now we go to 1976 and we're looking at a film called The Omen. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with The Omen. Um, personally, I had never seen it, but this is an idiosyncrasy of mine, which I will diverge, divulge to you. Um, I have said that I have a, something of an aversion to horror films. They make me uncomfortable. Sometimes I'm not ashamed to admit that they make it hard for me to fall asleep. Uh, they make me less inclined to go into the basement, uh, that sort of thing. Certainly as a kid, I, uh, my parents' basement didn't have windows, so it was pitch black down there. Uh, you could say Stygian darkness with the lights off. And to go upstairs, you had to turn the lights off downstairs and then go up the stairs. So, um, yeah, I didn't like watching horror movies because if I had to go, you know, switch the laundry or something, I would be very, very uh, uh, averse to doing so. Nonetheless, um, I developed a, a strange idiosyncrasy probably in college, uh, in the early days of Wikipedia and early days of the internet in general, uh, instead of seeing horror movies and watching them, I would simply, if I was interested in them, I would go to the internet and I would read a synopsis. So um, I know about the only because I read a synopsis about it long ago, but I've never actually seen the film. Nonetheless, um, I'll explain something, some aspects of the plot, and then I'll tell you about the amazing score here by Jerry Goldsmith. Jerry Goldsmith, uh, of course, one of the, the other many composers of uh, a Jewish background who uh, worked in Hollywood and contributed to, uh, to many films. Okay, I see we do have a, a question. Um, and we'll get to that after we, uh, we listen to this clip from The Omen. So, you wanna make your film scary. What's the film about? The Omen uh, introduces a trope which we're going to see in several examples in the back half of the program, and that is the trope of the demon-possessed child. That's very common, isn't it? If you think about horror films, how often do we see children who are possessed by Lucifer, possessed by Satan? It seems to come up quite often, doesn't it? Demonic possession of children. Now, why is it so popular? Well, I think a sociologist would say that the reason children and imagery and iconography associated with children, and as we'll see, sounds associated with children are so effective at scaring us, has to do with the fact that children, by their very nature, represent that which should scare us least, right? Children make us want to snuggle. They make us want to sing to them. They make us want to hug them and make them make us want to embrace them and kiss them. Uh, they, you know, the idea of having a child who speaks in a low gravelly voice because they're possessed by Satan or uses telekinetic powers to uh, commit all sorts of acts of atrocity and destruction, uh, this creates a fundamental dissonance in our perception of what's transpiring on screen. So the use of children and possession as a trope uh, is very common. Now, what Jerry Goldsmith does here, once again, uh, I think it's fair to use the word brilliant. The story here revolves around a couple and the, uh, the husband is, uh, he's a diplomat and uh, someone who, who serves later in the film as an ambassador. And in the, in the early part of the film, they're living in Italy. He's a, an ambassador in Italy. And his wife is pregnant, she goes to give birth, but the child dies. Now, rather than tell her that the child has died, a mysterious figure associated with the Catholic Church, because after all, that's another trope that comes up over and over again in the horror movies, the idea of exorcism, the figure in the clerical collar who brazenly uh, tries to remove the demonic presence from the afflicted child. Nonetheless, in this case, this shadowy figure approaches and says, essentially, um, you know, there's this child that was just born, the mother died in childbirth. We can swap the children and your wife doesn't have to know that she lost her baby in delivery. So already we have a very sinister plot introduced early. So the, the father uh, acquiesces and they take the child home. Unbeknownst to the mother that the child is actually um, 
the Antichrist. <laughs> that, that's actually, that's not uh, me being uh, cheeky, but that's actually uh, going to be introduced in the text of, of what they are um, singing about. And so here we have our first example of vocal music that we've looked at in Hara. Now, you think about this. We know, we've learned some of the things that make music scary or intensif intensify scary scenes, right? What did we say? We said register, how high or low the pitches are. That's important. We said dissonance, how close the tones are, if they agree or disagree, that's important. We talked about the half step, the semitone between uh, the shower scene in Psycho and Jaws, both of those using the semitone to great effect. But what would vocal music sound like? If you wanted to make your vocal music very scary, what would you do? I think that's a great question. Why use voices at all? Well, as we're going to see here, there's a few reasons why the vocal music is so effective. But rather than tell you about them a priori, I'm going to play the clip. This is um, interspliced scenes from The Omen, uh, and it's using the flagship theme of The Omen film, composed by Jerry Goldsmith, and it's called Ave Satan, which, for those of you who have a bit of Latin, you can translate. For those of you who went to Catholic school, you'll, you'll know what Ave means. Ave means hell, as in Ave Maria. Here we have Ave Satani. So you can guess what that means. Hail Satan is the theme song from The Omen. All right, let's listen to it. Oh, some of that stuff is hard to watch and I'm reminded of why I, generally speaking, avoid horror movies. Uh, but the music is wonderfully compelling here, is it not? So we know it's in Latin. The, the lyrics being um, Ave Satane, and then you have this sort of chanting, Sanguis bibimus, we drink the blood. Corpus edimus, we eat the body. Tole corpus satani, we raise the body of Satan. Um, hail Satan, <laughs> Ave, Ave versus Christus, hail Antichrist. Uh, it's extremely disturbing, isn't it? Now, why is it disturbing? I think there's a few reasons, and I think there's a few interesting things at play here, but some of them are not obvious. So let me start with a few. Start with one that's not obvious. When we think of Latin and when we think of this type of music, it's going to evoke for many the chanting Gregorian chant, does it not? And when we talk about Gregorian chant and this imagery which is intertwined with church history, and the sounds of church history, it brings us back to the Middle Ages. That was the era of Gregorian chant, right? It was also an era of uh, tremendous church dominance where the, the Catholic Church was the most powerful institution in Europe. And it was also an era of great superstition where people believed in demons and homunculi and succubi and denizens of hell, did they not? Now, if you ask the average person, if you were to go to one of my classes and ask my college students, do you believe in the presence of, of uh, imps and demons and, and void walkers and a succubus and this, so on and so forth, they will probably say, I don't even know what that is. Or they might laugh at the question. But by giving us music which evokes a time of great superstition where people did believe in this, it creates a sense of a time warp for us as viewers. We're back in that era where maybe you believe that these demons can exist. So it's, it's brilliant in that way. To use Gregorian chant in the omen for this Ave Satani, uh, it's not medieval, uh, authentically, idiomatically medieval, of course, because it uses a lot of dissonances that would, that would never happen in Gregorian chant. But I think the point is to evoke the sound. And it's really effective at doing that. So cool stuff here in the omen. Um, the other thing about it is that it's just foreign sounding to us. Latin is not a language that many people speak, but it's that archaic quality. It brings us back to a time where people believed in demons, and then there were others who worshiped these pagan uh, demonic deities, such as the god Baphomet. If you've ever seen the Goya painting, The Witch's Sabbath, uh, with the, the anthropomorphized goat sitting on its haunches, wearing a garland wreath and attended on by these crones, these witches offering up children as sacrifice. 
it, it all connects to that. So it's very effective here. You have a child who is the Antichrist and you have this chant-like music with a Latin choir singing this twisted, dissonant uh, rendition of Ave Satani. Bibimus sanguis, we drink the blood. Corpus edimus, we eat the body. It's a twisted uh, perversion of the words of Matthew that are a part of the Eucharistic ceremony. Are they not? So I think this is very effective stuff here in the moment. All right, I'm going to uh, look at chat. I see we have a question in chat. Yes, you can ask questions in the Q&A, that's right. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the, uh, the next film. I have many more. I'm gonna go through these somewhat quickly. Uh, here we have the music from the Halloween franchise. The reason I want to play this one, and we'll only listen to about 30 seconds, is two things. One, um, it's incredibly simple, and it's a great example of how music can be almost preposterously simple and yet be very effective, very instantly recognizable. It also gives us uh, an example of how rhythm here and meter are used to uh, create a sense of instability. And I'll show you how that works. The Halloween franchise, of course, follows the uh, the uh, <laughs> sociopathic antics of Michael Myers, and this is sort of his leitmotif as he uh, stalks his victims. So, the really, uh, the cool thing about this is the time signature. Everybody see this 5-4 here? Now, usually music is in 3-4 or in 4-4, and I say usually, I mean almost always. If you were to look at Beethoven or Mozart, the answer is always, uh, they, well, almost always. You're not going to find 5-4 in Mozart. There are 620 works, 626 in the Köchler catalog. Not a single one is in 5-4 time. There are over a thousand pieces in the Bach Werkefertzeichnis, the Bach catalog. There is not one single example of 5-4 as a leader. What does it mean for us as listeners? Some of you are saying, well, I don't know what that means. 5-4, 6-4, 7-4, 3-4, it doesn't mean anything to me. What I would suggest is this. 5-4 is a fundamentally asymmetrical meter. Asymmetrical meaning that the measure, the bar, is divided into three plus two, so that we as listeners are off balance, if you will. You can try an experiment with this. Try listening to the Halloween theme, to the Michael Myers theme, and try dancing to it. Better yet, now that sounds like an odd thing to do, and it is, but try marching to it. Try walking in time to it. What you'll find is that you won't be able to. You'll always be off step because of this 5-4 meter. Um, other than the 5-4, it's incredibly simple. It's basically just the same uh, fragment, and we call it an ostinato pattern. Ostinato from the Italian word, like in English, obstinate, meaning a pattern that repeats over and over again. And it just modulates to different pitch levels. Another cool thing about this is it was composed by John Carpenter. Now some of you are saying, wait, John Carpenter? I know that name. He's a horror figure, but isn't he a director, right? Didn't he do John Carpenter's Vampires? And that's true, but actually, um, apparently he learned music from his father and he is uh, somewhat of a, a practicing musician. He's the one who came up with this theme. Let's listen to it. So it's, it's in a minor key. This one is pretty tonal, I would say, although it shifts quite radically. And um, there's nothing to it. It's very straightforward, but if you count it, you're counting four, five, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. So again, that asymmetrical meter, that's from the Halloween franchise. All right, of course, Nightmare on Elm Street, we're gonna talk briefly about this. The Nightmare on Elm Street series follows Freddy Krueger, right? With his iconic fedora hat, his uh, striped sweater and oh yeah, who could forget, his murderously sharp razor claws um, that he uses to impale and, and, and uh, murder his victims. He stalks the dream. So here's getting back to the trope we discussed with the omen. In the omen, we talked about how composers use, well not composers, but directors and writers uh, use the imagery of children to great effect. Now, one of the most recognizable themes from the Nightmare on Elm Street is um, this sort of nursery rhyme, which is chanted regularly throughout the franchise. Let's listen to it. Goosebumps, yeah, um, or 
much. I did promise chills uh, up your spine or down your spine, and you certainly get them here. So why is this so effective? Again, it gets back to what we discussed with the uh, tropes that emerged in the 1970s with the Omen. There's no music here, right? Or no accompanying music. There's no instrumental sounds. It's just a child singing what sounds like it could be a nursery rhyme. And again, it uses or it evokes imagery associated with the Catholic Church, right? One, two, Freddie's coming for you. It's almost like na, 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 has that the interval of the minor third. One, two, Freddie's coming for you. Three, four, better lock your door. Five, six, get your crucifix. Seven, eight, better stay up late. Nine, ten, never sleep again. And of course, you get what in uh, the film industry and in the music business we call the drop. The drop is where you have a sudden silence and then bang, this percussive sound right at the moment of impact, for example, uh, in what we just saw. So it works. The usage of, of imagery involving children is very effective. We've got one more um, and then we'll go on. Okay, here is um, something from the Insidious franchise, which was uh, all of them been directed by James Wan. He's primarily a, a horror guy, although he did also direct uh, The Fast and Furious number seven, which grossed over a billion dollars, if you can believe it. So um, in this particular scene, the Insidious franchise is all about possession as well, demonic possession. And we have these characters who are sort of demonologists who are hired to uh, investigate and perform exorcisms. Um, now, in this uh, particular case, the young girl in question uh, thinks she is this uh, figure named Parker, uh, this man who's responsible for uh, murder and mayhem. Let's have a look at this trailer. Listen to the music here. And uh, this is from the 21st century, the first example. So we have imagery. Notice this looks like a little girl's room, right? To the T with the pink curtains and drapes, um, the wallpaper, the dolls and rocking chairs. Uh, it's extremely disturbing. And this is another trope is that we see the character from the back. We don't see the face until the moment uh, climax, uh, uh, demonic climax in the scene. And then they sort of pan to the child. And often the child's eyes are glazed over because it's not really them. They've been inhabited and taken over by some demonic presence. Let's look, listen. Okay, did you notice that? Right at the moment where he touched the shoulder, what did we hear? A gong. Now, what could be more ominous than a gong? A bell sound, right? Because what do we associate bells with? Death, do we not? Now, it could be celebration, that's true, but bells are often associated with death and lamentation. So it's, again, we have silence, and then right at the moment where the hand touches the shoulder, gong. It's very effective, listen again. Okay, again, not much music there, but when we get that moment where the demonic presence is revealed at the end, we have this sliding, glistening string sound, which uh, is not tonal at all. And much of what is uh, underscoring that scene is at the edge of hearing, it's just these low pitch, what they call LFE. This became very popular in the 21st century, using LFE, which stands for low frequency effects. Low frequency, at the edge of hearing, um, it's music that's so, the, the frequencies are so low that they're actually off the piano. They're to the left, if you will, of the lowest note on the piano. And what it does is it creates this sort of bubbling quality of something that's about to erupt. And often the LFE leads to a big per percussive uh, explosion. Um, and it works very well in tandem with the imagery. Okay, I'm gonna skip the conjuring. Um, if you're wondering, do we ever uh, find traditional Western music in uh, horror movies? The answer is uh, absolutely. I want to play two brief examples. Here's Hannibal Lecter when he's not uh, murdering people and cooking brains and feeding them to them. Apparently, he's listening to Bach. In this scene, he's listening famously to Bach's Goldberg variations. Have a listen. Ugh, what a savage, uh, that Hannibal Lecter. Hard to watch some of these scenes, but. Couple of things which are really interesting here. Why have Hannibal Lecter listened to the Bach Goldberg variations? That's a curious choice, isn't it? 
And I think the answer has to do with this. Who is Hannibal Lecter? Well, of course, he's a sociopath and a murderer, but he's also an incredibly refined individual, is he not? He's a doctor, after all. He's a surgeon. He has tremendous medical knowledge. And, uh, and so to give him this patina of elegance and sophistication, what, ha what should you have him listen to? And of course, it would be the Bach uh, Goldberg variation, something by J.S. Bach, a man whose music is often described as being very cerebral, appealing to people of high intellect. There's a great book, which um, I'm sure the library has at least one copy, called Gödel Escher Bach, and it's about the connection between Kurt Gödel, the mathematician, uh, M.C. Escher, the lithograph artist, and, uh, and Bach. And it's all about how Bach's music appeals to people who like to contemplate um, very complex and lofty ideas. So having Hannibal Lecter listen to it, it's fantastic. And then, of course, the abrupt transition to um, the atonal dissonance stuff that we've talked about is very effective. Only a few examples left to go, and then we'll get to the questions. Here's one, uh, an another example of Western traditional canon in a uh, film score. Let's listen. I see another question that's great. I'm sure you have more questions about <clears throat> this particular tune. The tune is called the Dies Irae, the Days of Wrath. This is a text from, that many of you may recognize from the Catholic Requiem sequence. Um, actually, it goes back to the Middle Ages. This was a text that uh, was used as a chant melody and it was associated with funerals. That's how we know it from the Requiem. Mozart set the Dies Irae to music. Giuseppe Verdi set the Dies Irae to music. But this particular melody, lo low in the brass, bam, 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 comes from Middle Ages. It was a, a chant melody from the days of Gregorian chant. And it was set to the, uh, the text, Dies Irae, Dies Ila, which refers to the days of wrath. The days of wrath, judgment, coming before the Almighty to be judged, where you, your fate will be decided for all eternity. Will you burn in a lake of fire and brimstone or will you, will you be admitted to the pearly gates? It's all about judgment here. So that's where you get the Dies Irae. And some of you may recognize this uh, melody because it was used famously by Hector Berlioz in the uh, last movement of his Symphony Fantastique from the 1830s. Listen to that. We see some 19th century authentic instruments there, the serpent and the ophicleide, the predecessor of the tuba. So if going back to The Shining, you could say, oh, well, Gil, did they get, did uh, they use, you know, Hector Berlioz for the inspiration here? The answer is probably, but again, Berlioz, in, when he wrote that, uh, when he wrote the fifth movement of his um, Symphony Fantastique, he was writing it 800 years after the initial melody had been uh, recorded in, in the codexes of the time. All right, so two examples of music from the, um, from the classical canon in Hannibal, we get the Goldberg variations by Bach and in The Shining, which of course famously features Jack Nicholson as Jack Torrance, slowly spiraling into insanity in the film, um, Stanley Kubrick film, uh, we get the Dies Irae, this music which evokes funerals and judgment. Okay. All right, I wanna talk now about Stranger Things, which um, many of you know because it's, it's starting in 2016 or 17, it became a cult phenomenon, 16. Uh, on, on Netflix, it became incredibly popular, uh, a series conceived by two writers uh, who collectively go by the Duffer Brothers. And um, what you notice about this score is that even though it comes from the, you know, the, the 20 teens, um, it's incredibly retro in the way it primarily uses analog synthesizer sounds uh, for the music. Have a listen to the first track, this is the title track. All right, now, if I were standing in front of you in the library now, I would say, how many people have seen Stranger Things? And I'm guessing that a fair number of hands would go up. Um, if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. It's, it's warm, it's nostalgic, it is scary at times, but 
um, the themes of friendship and camaraderie that dominate the show. There's great humor in it. It's definitely worth watching. It's well written, and as uh, some of you have are, are just now learning, the music is quite compelling. So um, Kyle Dixon and Michael Stein are the, uh, the composer duo behind the music from Stranger Things. And if I asked you, if you hadn't seen the uh, series on Netflix, and I said, uh, I just showed you this opening, and this is the music that plays during the credits. And I said, when do you think it was from? You might very well answer, oh, how about 1985, right? This doesn't look like something from 2016. So uh, Dixon and Stein are clearly evoking that older sound. Here's a really uh, cool scene of the two of them um, actually showing you the equipment they use. Now, when we think of a modern studio, you might think of shiny gizmos and gadgets, which, which um, are more appropriate for what we're, we, you know, composers use when they're uh, writing music these days and, and mixing music and recording music. But here we go into this room, which looks like something out of the 1980s or even prior to the 80s. These are all uh, analog uh, signal synth machines that uh, provide ways to modulate pitch on various sound waves without getting too technical. This is really more acoustics and electroacoustics than it is composition or music theory. They're kind of creating tones. Uh, so rather than being in a key, you can't be in a key with these instruments because they play quarter tones and everything in between. Or if you like to think of a piano, uh, they play tones which are in between the keys of the piano. So pretty cool stuff here. Let's listen to them talk a little bit about their uh, process for writing music. A fascinating window into the workshop of the composers here. And you can see that they're not using anything that most people would identify as traditional instruments, right? They're using equipment which in the 20 teens is outdated. It's, uh, this is music from decades or instruments, I should say, from decades ago. But what it allows them to do is capture that retro feeling that they're going for. So the show is set in the 80s. And, um, and therefore, they're able to uh, conjure up the sound of the 80s. And using things like, for example, the microtonal um, idea that he just uh, introduced, using tones that you can't play on a piano that are in the cracks between notes. Remember that musical tones correspond to frequencies, they're vibrations per second, um, and they strike our ear a certain way, and we perceive them as pitch, how high or low a tone is. But if you've got a, a, a B flat on a piano and an A, um, there's room in between. Now you can't play those, those notes on the piano because the, the shortest distance is between the B flat and the A, but nonetheless, we'll watch one short clip from uh, Stranger Things, and we'll see, uh, how the music comes together with the action. So in this scene, uh, Dustin and uh, Mike are at the quarry and they've been chased by these bullies who are you know, threatening them. One of them's got a knife and they instructed Mike, they say, jump off the cliff and into the quarry, into the lake. And then Eleven, their supernatural friend, shows up to save the day. And that's where the music gets cued. So Eleven's theme is played here. Notice how synth heavy it is. Again, everything played here uh, not by humans uh, playing conventional instruments, but rather by adjusting knobs and spinning wheels and maybe striking a few keys here and there. Crazy! I love that. She's our friend and she's crazy. All right, so we're gonna, I'm gonna wrap it up now and take some questions, but you can see here a huge spectrum of, of uh, a musical technique and approach used. And some of it is very groundbreaking and some of it is very retro. So when we start in the early days, in the 1930s, we have music which is more or less in the symphonic tradition of the decades preceding. And then when we get to psycho, we get a new type of music which is so painfully dissonant and so high pitched that it screeches in our ears. When we get to Jaws, we get the opposite. We get notes that are sort of subterranean, if you will, living in that abyssal level where sharks dwell you know, many feet below the ocean surface. We've seen the intensification of rhythm and tempo uh, to create a sense of, uh, of the approach of the menace. Uh, we've looked at the theme of uh, the trope, I should say, of children as, a, as an effective use for conveying terror and how music like nursery rhymes and simple tunes as we see in, uh, in Nightmare on Elm Street are used to raise the hackles on our neck. Um, and then we get to 
you know, the omen, we've got vocal music, which evokes the Latin language music of the Catholic Church of the Middle Ages, of an era where demons and uh, the denizens of the underworld seem more realistic somehow, and therefore we allow ourselves to believe in it, perhaps. Um, so some very, very clever things done by the composers we've talked about, uh, including uh, Dixon and Stein, the composers from Stranger Things. If you haven't seen Stranger Things and you do have Netflix, it's a strong recommend. Um, I think it's a, a series that will especially appeal to people who grew up in the 80s. So I was an 80s baby. I didn't really grow up in the 80s, but I recognize a lot of the themes. And if you were around in the 80s, uh, certainly you would enjoy it as well. And the music is a big part of why it's so enjoyable. It's very, very effective. And as we saw with that peek behind the curtain with the composers, uh, it's not at all what you might expect a composer's workshop would look like. So uh, what a pleasure it's been. Before I take questions, I just want to make, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to make a brief announcement. Um, so I mentioned that this program was part of the uh, One Book, One Community series that the library is doing. And next Wednesday at 7 p.m., the library is hosting, uh, it's hosting uh, an event uh, with um, a film historian, Max Alvarez, I believe is his name. And it's called uh, From Boris Karloff to Robert De Niro to Mel Brooks. And he's going to be discussing, Max is going to discuss uh, Frankenstein as the springboard to the horror film canon. Um, very cool stuff, and if you're interested in what we talked about tonight, I strongly uh, recommend you check it out, sign up for that next Wednesday. Uh, again, that's featuring film historian Max Alvarez. So with that in mind, um, I'm gonna look over at the chat. Yes, Karen, you're absolutely uh, correct. Um, the bell toll for the dead, yep. And Berlioz used it in the Symphony Fantastique, yep. Way ahead there. Good stuff. All right. Well, uh, it's been a real pleasure to uh, share this music with you. It's not something that I've talked about often, but uh, this gave me a unique opportunity to investigate uh, why I uh, have such an aversion to horror films. And it turns out that music is a big part of it. I want to thank the Darien Library. Um, it's, um, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here tonight and to, uh, to share something special with you. Thank you for uh, those who are chatting. Uh, um, thank you so much. Thank you for those who could make it. Um, very, very cool. Hope you enjoyed it. And um, hope that I didn't scare you too much. I know I scared myself preparing all this stuff. Uh, Jerry and Library, any, uh, anything to add? You do um, have a question um, well, about the future of horror. Ah, okay, great. I see this just came in. Uh, terrific. Anonymous attendee asks, what is the future of horror film scores? Uh, what new sounds will be explored? Um, I think we're going to see a lot of what we uh, have seen, generally speaking. We're going to see a lot of dissonance. We're going to see a lot of these uh, sort of sudden percussive, what we call jump sounds. Um, you know, the retro thing that we observe in Stranger Things, will we see that again? You know, if you're, if you're trying to evoke a certain time period, uh, you would. So if we have a, let's say, a horror movie or a series that's set in the 1990s or in the 2000 aughts, in the early 2000s, um, it might be cool to see if a composer from the 2020s goes back and tries to channel the 20 aughts um, or the 1990s by using sounds and effects which are more uh, idiomatically appropriate for that period. But uh, in general, I think horror film scores are going to stay mostly rooted in the idea of sudden percussive loud bangs and gongs and funeral bells. Um, it would be cool to hear more uh, Latin music. Um, one thing I will say is that uh, horror mo movie music kind of has, a, I would say, a bit of a stigma in the composer community. And some of you will be able to already, even after this past hour, uh, say why. And the answer is that it's, well, it tends to go back to the well quite often, does it not? There's a few tricks that you can use as a composer, but there's not a lot of leverage uh, or wiggle room in terms of writing beautiful melodies. A horror movie composer is not gonna write soaring uh, epic uh, tunes that get you know, burrowed in our ears. Uh, the Germans have this fantastic term, they use orvorm, an earworm. You're not gonna get that in a horror film where you know, you're gonna walk out of the theater singing the tune. 
And let me just suggest that if you do walk out of the theater, sing the tune, you might disturb the people around you. Can you imagine walking out and singing Ave Satani, Bibimus Sanguinis, Corpus Edimus? I mean, these are not things that you would say. So um, the, um, the point I was making is that there's a bit of a stigma because it is sort of monochromatic. In fact, this was spoofed. Has anybody seen the movie uh, Forgetting Sarah Marshall? It's with Jason Segel and, uh, and uh, Mila Kunis and uh, Kristen Bell. It's, it's a great movie, it's a rom-com, but in the film, Jason Siegel's character, he's a composer and he works for a, a show that's sort of like a, a law and order SVU type show. And he sits there and he just sort of plays on a synthesizer low tones, he just sort of does this. And later in the film, he's sort of lamenting his, his uh, fate to Mila Kunis' character. And she says, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm a you know, composer. And she says, that's amazing, what do you play? And he looks at her sort of gloomily and he says, I play low foreboding tones. So what's the future of horror film scores foreboding tones? Okay, <laughs> uh, Krishna, I see a question in chat here. Do you feel that the music is very loud? Uh, is that is as effective as the LFE sounds? Yeah, great, great, great question here, yeah. Um, so the loud bangs are gonna be used at the moment where the knife comes down or where Freddy Krueger's hand emerges um, you know, from the ethereal dream uh, quintessence and stabs the, uh, impales the victim. That's where you're gonna get the bangs and the LFE is gonna be what's setting the tone up until the moment where the killer strikes. Um, in a slasher film, like Friday the 13th comes to mind, you know, with Jason Voorhees and the hockey mask, uh, you get a lot of, of that sort of, you know, uh, bang percussive, again, we call them jump sounds, where all of a sudden there's nothing, silence, and then bang, a percussive sound. So literally, we call them jump sounds because they make us jump. Whereas in the psychological thriller, uh, psychological thriller like The Shining or like Hannibal, uh, that's where you're going to get the, the, maybe the influences of the classical style, right? We see that in both of those films. They're very cerebral film. The Shining, um, there's a lot to think about. There's a lot to contemplate in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the slow downward spiral, the vortex that brings the character of Jack Torrance into the abyss. Um, so mystery, psychological, you're going to get more perhaps of a classical influence, whereas the slasher film, it's gonna be a little bit uh, more monochromatic, one note, typical slasher music and low foreboding tones. So great questions, very good questions, folks. I see so many, uh, now that I'm scrolling through uh, our attendees, thank you to everybody who came out tonight uh, or stayed in tonight. Um, see some friends from the library, I see some students, welcome students, some family members, what a pleasure. Uh, Thank you to the Darien Library for making this happen. And uh, let me just plant one more uh, seed for you. And that is that I will be back on July 21st. Again, July 21st with the topic TBA. Uh, we won't right. divulge anything now, but it will be announced and I'll put it on my social media. Uh, for those who want to follow me, uh, Dr. Gil Harrell Lectures, just Google it, it'll come up. You don't have to be on Facebook to, uh, to follow the page. You can treat it like any other website. Gil, thank you for everything. Wonderful. My yeah, pleasure. really. Thank enjoy. you so much. I always learn something um, great and wonderful. I learn a lot. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, it's it's a pleasure, and I look forward to the next one. Until then, everybody, uh, stay well. And if you're gonna watch horror movies, watch it with a partner. It's always better that way.